not just outwardly, but right now in our hearts. Grow our faith, I pray, through the preached word this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, John. Thank you, Josh. Bless you, brother. Uh, so, have a little different mission today. Uh, get the opportunity to preach for the first time in a little while. Uh, you know, you, uh, uh, you, you do what God's told you to do. You serve where God's called you to serve. Uh, you get in there and you be part of what God's called you to do. I firmly believe in that. And I firmly believe that's, that's what we're doing here. And as we prepare to transition, as the Bowman family plans on uh, vacating back to South Carolina where the winters are mild and the summers are terrible, uh, we, uh, we are going to miss them. So Tracy and I were just talking yesterday. I looked at her and I said, uh, you know what? I am ready for winter to be over. She's like, yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking, you know what? This is... This is, I think this may be, is Fort Leavenworth more, further north than this? Or they're about on the same line of latitude, aren't they? They're pretty close. But my goodness, I'm ready to get back further down where the winters aren't so bad. And you get 70 degree days in January every now and then. Oh, uh, yeah, California, well, that's a different story. And we won't go there. So uh, I'll leave out right where it lands. Thank you very much, uh, Rochelle. So this morning, uh, I, I want to speak to you about the second half of Job. Last week, Chaplain Bowman gave, and I told him this after the service, and I don't, I don't say this, uh, well, I rarely ever say it. That was absolute, the best presentation of the first half of Job I have ever heard. And he heard me say that, so I'm not just saying it because his wife and kids are here. So I'll just let you guys know that, hey, Mark said something good about it. No, Jameson, is a, uh, Jameson has a depth of understanding of the Scripture that, uh, that is phenomenal. Uh, and uh, and I'm, I'm very grateful for him to have been our pastor over these past eight months for me, but over the past couple of years for those who've been in this service. Amen. And I'll just tell you today that as we, as, we go through the, as we go through these slides, the sermon title today is Ridiculed, Rescued, and Redeemed. All right? Now, so I didn't coordinate this with John, but John said up front, let's be real. So you guys got all the R's you could ever deal with today, okay? <laughs> And at the end of this time, we're going to have a response and a review. So it's just so many R's. But here's, the, here's my encouragement to you as a, uh, as a Christian, as a disciple of Christ. My encouragement to each one of us is to, when we hear the word, take notes. Do something. Write something down. Because I know that for me, uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a formula out there for all you educator folks. You know the formula. What you hear, you remember this much of what you hear. You remember this much of what you write. You remember this much of what you see. So I just encourage you guys as we move forward, uh, take notes as you're, as you're sitting in service because I believe as I was going back over the notes from, from this past week especially uh, that I remember three big things that, uh, that Chaplain Bowman said. Now, he said a lot more than three things, but here are the three things that I want to point out from the first half of Job that he talked about. Number one is the enemy scouts to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, he, he put that in there and showed what the devil did. But you know, Jesus said that in John 10, 10. He said it in the New Testament. He said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that what? They might have life to the full, right? And so I believe an abundant life is what God has given us. I honestly believe that. I, I don't ever doubt that. I've never doubted that. Well, I did doubt it a little bit when I was growing up because that's not what we were taught. But uh, once I got hold of the teaching that said, you know, God is there for you and he wants you to have an abundant life, man, I've been all in. I was like, you know what, God, that's the, that's the father that I want to be to my kids. That's the God that he is to me because he said in the New Testament again, he said, if you being fleshly fathers know how to good, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven be able to do that for you? And so that's a Morgan paraphrase there. I'm organized it. So I can use Morganized Morganism. I got a lot of them. So you guys will hear them over the next, uh, over the next several months. Uh, there are a lot of them out there. And Keith, you can take any of these and write them down and use them yourself. You can share them back there if you guys want to. So uh, probably, you may have done that before. The second point he said was God, or one of, the, one of the other points was God permits but never authors evil. You know, when God created Adam and Eve and the garden and everything in it and the earth, how did he create it? Did he create it flawed or did he create it perfect? He created it perfect. And so God was not the author of what came next. What was the author of what came next? Or who was the author of what came next? Satan was, right? And it was what? An attempt, an attempt to rebel against authority and say, I'm no longer submitting. And this is what's going to happen. So when sin came into the earth through, this, through the original sin, now Satan has 
free reign. The first one says he goes around, he's looking to see who he can steal, kill, and destroy. Right? And so as we look at that, we think, okay, well, what's, what's the answer to that? Well, I think the answer to that is what Jesus Christ did on, on the cross for us. That he came that we might have life and we might have it to the full. So that is the two-minute version of Morgan's theology. That I'm going to believe this scripture and I'm going to believe the word. And everything I see in the word comes through that filter. So as you guys hear me speak on the second half of Job today, it's not going to be, oh, you got to hang on by your fingernails because we're just barely making it and we're all going to die and we're all going to get beat up and have boils like Job. I'm going to tell you that I certainly believe that Job, we can't place him in time in scripture, right? Jameson taught us that last week and we've heard that many times. We can't place him in time. But if we try to place him in time, do you think he came before or after Jesus? Help me out. Okay, we're pretty sure of that, right? Well, because it's the Old Testament and Jesus in the New Testament. I mean, we ought to be able to figure that one out, right? So what does that mean? So Job was not operating under the covenant that we have through Jesus Christ and through the shed blood of Christ. Job was operating completely separately in a different place. And if we take him all the way back, then he wasn't under the Abrahamic covenant. He wasn't under the covenant God made with Noah. And he certainly wasn't under the covenant God made with Christ. So I, I ask you to, as we talk about this today and as we go through this, to, to take it in that context, to look at it and go, you know what, this was back when original sin had happened, and man, it was a free-for-all. And people did what they wanted to do in their own eyes because they were their own gods, they had their own morals, and that's the way they lived. But Job is an example of somebody who, even in that time, without the covenant of Christ, and without the Noah or the Abrahamic covenant, was willing to stand up and suffer and deal with, the, deal with the abuse that the devil was putting on him so that he could be redeemed. And so today as we look at this, the third one is this, Satan authors confusion and God never does. Amen. I have to ask myself the question. When I'm in a position where I'm upset or I'm confused and somebody wants to say, well, yeah, God's just teaching you a lesson. I'm going to stop for just a second. I'm going to stop. I'm going to say, is this killing, stealing, or destroying? And if it meets any one of those three criteria, then it's not God. The fourth criteria that I like to use is, is this because I'm stupid and made a bad decision? <laughs> that one usually, that usually sets them all up. So anytime I'm going through that kind of thing, it's not God. I, I, that's a pretty simple one for me. It's because I made a bad decision, a bad choice, and I'm dealing with the consequences of my bad decisions. So there I was a long, long time ago when debit cards first came out. I was 18, okay, so I'm going I'm I'm to preface it with that. Wow, I just go to the bank, I put this in there, I put in this little number, and I get money out. Now, I knew better than to think that they were just going to be passing out money all the time to me, right? But for whatever reason, I was like, oh, man, this is pretty, this is pretty sweet, so I could go get money. But then I realized when the bank statement came in, hmm, there's some consequences for these poor decisions that I've been making uh, to get me some extra pizza on the weekend or whatever the decision was. Thank the Lord I didn't go so far that I couldn't recover from it. But, you know, we learn it, it's either stealing, killing, destroying, or my bad decisions and my bad choices. So as we start out today, I want to take you guys into uh, uh, this about ridiculed, rescued, and redeemed. So... As we, looked at the, as we look at ridicule, in, Job, in Job's situation, his closest friends and even his wife were the ones who were ridiculing him. Did you realize that? They were the ones that were saying to him, hey, his wife said, curse God and die. I mean, she was upfront about it, right? She was like, ah, okay, yeah. I'm tired of living with you because you are costing me a whole lot of extra energy. That's what I'm thinking she said to him, but I'm not sure about that. That wasn't in there. But curse God and die. That's what she said. How can you maintain your integrity through this? And then his three friends that came along, they had great words to speak, right? They were like, hey, I've got this, I've got that. And Job's looking at it going, you know what? This is not what I remember God saying to me from the beginning. I want to ask you guys a couple questions. Have you ever been ridiculed for any reason? You don't have to raise your hand. I'll raise my hand. Okay, I can think back to freshman in college. I'm sitting in a sociology class. Nobody knows my history. Nobody knows who I am. Nobody knows my situation. And I spoke up about an issue of the day, a social issue of the day, from a standpoint 
that wasn't agreed on. Let me just say it like that. It wasn't agreed on by everybody in the room. All right. And so one young lady decides to start taking care of me right there in class in front of everybody. You blah, blah, blah. You grew up with a silver spoon in your mouth and your parents are doing this and your parents. And that's when the old hand went up. I said, hold on a second. First off, I'm married. I have two kids. Uh, and my parents aren't paying a penny for this college education that I'm here for. So let me clear that up for you up front. That stopped the conversation. But I look at it, ridicule, why? Because you had a different opinion. You know, in America today, around the world, but especially in our own, in our own country, it, it's sad to see how people get to the point where we ridicule each other because of our different viewpoints on social issues, on our different, view, different viewpoints on everything that you can think of. One of the things that I've found that's helping me, because I'm telling you, when I believe something, you can't convince me otherwise. I'm just going to tell you, that's just my personality. When I'm, when I'm locked into something, I'm locked into it. And you say, well, yeah, because you're old. No, it's not because I'm old. Yeah. It's because I've been doing that since I was, I can't remember, five years old, the first memories I have, four years old. I did it because that's who I am. But what I found, the temperance that can come from putting yourself in contact with people who don't agree with you, and you can have a conversation, it can change the way you look at things. It's not for ridicule. It's not for, I'm better than you. It's for God to work some of the rough edges off. If you trace it, I always talk about it, uh, about rubbing the rough edges off. You know, sandpaper. Well, sometimes I've been in a rock tumbler. I don't know you guys know the difference in a sandpaper and a rock tumbler, right? Yeah, a rock tumbler busts the rocks up. All right, and then you can refine them after the fact. So I, I encourage you, though, as, you, as you're listening to this today, have you ever been ridiculed? How did it make you feel? I'm going to do my Dr. Phil, my best Dr. Phil today. How did that make you feel? What happened? How did you feel when you were ridiculed? Well, the first thing I felt was attacked. And what's your normal response when you're attacked? Fight back. That's right. That's right. Or at least defend yourself, right? And so... I look at it like this, and I think Joel had every, uh, Job had every right in this situation. I'm going to look at you, and I'm going to say Job, though. I really am, Joel. I'm going to look at you, and I'm going to say Job. Uh, Job had every right to be defensive because of his friends. And I ask you this question. Who do you allow to speak into your lives? The friends that, got, that Job had falsely accused him. They said, well, you must have done this, or you must have done that, or you must have done this. And this is chapters 24 through 42 of Job. So it's a big piece that we're going to boil down into a 30-minute sermon today. But these friends, or these so-called friends that Job had, were the ones that were telling him, hey, you must be this, you must be that. And they were going from different standpoints. One was going from tradition, one was going from religion, one was going from just a practical standpoint. Well, obviously, you know, we know God too, and we know that God is not the author of bad things. You must be, number four, you must have done something idiotic. And now you're being caught on it, right? So these guys just kept on. Uh, so... I, the question I have for you then, who are you allowing to speak into your life? Because here's, here's one of the things that I've found. If I stay around, this is, a, this is a great one that I heard in Fort Hood a couple years ago, the nattering nabobs of negativity. If I listen to the nattering nabobs of negativity all the time, what is my attitude going to become? It's absolutely going to become negative. But if I put myself in the counsel of people who love God for one and are going to be optimistic about things, then I'm going to have a different outlook on life. I'm going to have a look at it that says, hey, you know what? This is going to work out okay. But if I get falsely accused, what's my first response? My first response is to say, oh, no, you're not going to accuse me of that. Uh, I didn't do that or whatever the, whatever the thousand things are. You know, Jesus in the New Testament, Satan used Scripture to tempt Jesus. He said, isn't it written that X, Y, Z? And Jesus came back with what? Every single time, the rest of the story. Jesus came back with the Paul Harvey edition of the... That's, that's, a, that's an old reference for you younger folks. Uh, but that's a... Uh, Jesus came back with the rest of the story where the Scripture was concerned because Satan tried to use a piece of it to get him off track or to take him out of the way. And so I would ask you today, from a ridicule standpoint, who do you allow to speak into your life? Some of you may have grown up in a situation where, uh, you know, ridicule was just part of what you dealt with. Whatever the reason is, if you had something physically wrong, if there was something emotionally bothering you, if something academically wasn't going right. You know, I, I was telling, I was, I was telling the, the team this morning, my little brother, if he walked through the back room, and David, if you watch this, you know who you are. 
uh, if he walked through the back door, he would find something to crack on me about just like that. Because sarcasm is his, you know, that's the way he relates to his older brothers. Well, when you have four older brothers, or five, uh, you guys understand uh, that, that, that sometimes that's the way they related. But I looked at it and I thought, you know, I know with him it's good natured. And it's, it's, part of, it's part of our relationship. I told, a, I told a team this morning, I said, Tracy and I, uh, when we first got married, Tracy's not a sarcastic person. That's not, that's not her love language. I found that out the hard way. Uh, it's taken about 36 years to figure that out completely. But sarcasm is, is an absolute, absolute non-starter. And why? Because I think about it, oh, it's just good-natured fun. But she says to me, you know that hurts when you say that because in the midst of your sarcasm, there's some truth or you would have never said it in the first place. Who do you allow to speak into your life? Second thing we're going to look at is being rescued. What brings us back from the brink where ridicule is concerned? For those who've been ridiculed in your lives growing up and, and, and you were told you would never amount to anything, a thousand different things, and you put yourself in a position because parents don't always do it right, right? Now, as a parent, I didn't always do it right. As a grandparent, I think I'm a whole lot better. Uh, but, uh, you know, those grandbabies are going to hear positive words out of their grandpa all the time, uh, going to hear loving, kind words, even when... They show me their 1,400 baseball cards and how many of them they have original signatures on uh, and on, on FaceTime on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> so uh, I look at it and say, man, I love those kids. Uh, but what happens as parents that we, that we don't get the, uh, I don't know, we don't get the memo up front where the ridicule is concerned. And sometimes we'll get angry because as, as you guys are aware, any parent is aware, one of your biggest struggles is to not be angry with your children. You discipline your children, you train your children, but not in anger. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a difficult thing. But So what, what about rescued? Rescued is the second one here, so we're going to talk about this. So Elihu, who was the not friend, he was the young guy out there. So, so imagine this. You have Job and three of his closest friends. They're in their, I'm going to say they're in their 70s or 80s, right? Uh, they're very healthy dudes. They're all talking. But these wise old sages had all the answers. And there was a young dude. Young like Josh. Uh, there was a young dude out there, and he's sitting there every day at the gate. He's sitting there listening and going, you know what, I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's true, but I'm going to listen because I don't want to be rude to my elders, right? Uh, how many of you were taught to respect your elders? A few of us. Okay, for the rest of you, it's still a good thing. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but, yeah, he, so he decided, you know what, I've listened to this garbage for long enough. He stood up in a position and said, I'm going to speak the truth of the character of God. I'm going to tell who God really is because I don't believe you guys are getting it. I believe you're taking Job down a path that's going to lead to his destruction and you're not tracking what's being said that is, that is correct. And so he, he spoke the truth, countering the false accusations. We're going to read this together. Uh, I want you guys to read the yellow. And I'm going to read the white. And I'll read the last yellow one with you. From Job chapter 34, verses 10 through 12. It said, Therefore, listen to me. You men of understanding. For he repays man according to his work and makes man to find a reward according to his way. Surely God will never be wickedly, nor will the Almighty pervert justice. Powerful words. Would you agree? Yeah. This is what Chaplain Bowman pre preached to us last week about the absolute truth that God is not the author of evil. Allows but doesn't author. Far be it from God to do wickedly. You know, if, I, if, if you take away one thing, if you take away one thing from our study of Job over these past two weeks, I would ask that you take this away. That it's not God that brings wickedness, disaster, disease, and sickness on people. Amen. It is not God that does that. That's what, that's, that, we can stop. I won't because i got 15 more minutes, but uh, uh, if you guys just stay with me. God does not do wickedness. Surely he won't pervert justice. When he looks at what is right, what does he say? Uh, I was looking last night. Uh, there's a, I don't know if you guys ever heard the, the guy. And this is, I'm going way back now. T.L. Osborne. He would be 100 next year uh, if he was still alive. He died at 90 back in 2013. T.L. Osborne had a ministry there in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where uh, I went to school and so did Chaplain Bowman. Uh, and he had a ministry, and T.L. would say this. He said, God is a good God, and the devil's a bad devil. And then he would say, poor devil. Uh, and I thought about it, I thought, yep, yeah, uh, that's exactly right. 
God is a good God and the devil's a bad devil. And I'm going to get, I'll go back to my four things again. Uh, if it's stealing, killing, destroying, or me being stupid, I can't blame God for it. I can't blame God. Now, we have a prayer request that came in today about a four-year-old that has leukemia. We recently diagnosed with leukemia. I will tell you this. I still believe today that God is a healer in our land. I still believe that the blood that Jesus shed for our healing and the stripes that he bore for our healing is still applicable in today's situation. I want you guys to know, you're going to hear a lot of who I am today and where I'm coming from from my belief standpoint, but I believe that that four-year-old that has been stricken with leukemia wasn't stricken with leukemia by God. Amen. That child is under an attack, and that attack is a spiritual attack that has manifested itself in the physical and I still believe that by faith, when we say God in the name of Jesus, we believe for that child to be healed, that God heals. Yeah. And so I'm just, I'm, that's, that's my boldness. I told you, you guys, when I, when, I, when I have a position on something, you know, unless you, can, unless you can show me something else, one of the things I've always said about that is this. If I base my faith on someone else's circumstances, mm -hmm. then my belief system is going to change every mm -hmm. single
And, you know, I've, I've found that in, in my own life that God loves me. He cares for me. He forgives me. He knows he didn't create a per perfect vessel when he created Mark Morgan. But he also knows that he gave me his perfect son, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So that when God looks at me, he looks through the blood of Jesus Christ over my entire life and everything that I'm about. So as we close this out today, Josh, if you would come back up, uh, uh, come back up and play for us a little bit here. What is our call today? What's the call today that I would, I would put to you from this scripture, from this passage? Well, first and foremost, if you don't know Jesus, that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Bottom line. I know Chad Bowman does that every week, and I will tell you, he learned it in a different place in Tulsa than I learned it. We were in two different churches at the same time, but my pastor said this, Pastor Billy Joe Doherty from Victor Christian Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He said this, he said, I offer an invitation for salvation every single time I preach. And he said, and here's why. He said, because the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, what if somebody in that room today goes to eternity when they leave here and they, you never gave them the opportunity. And so I just encourage you today, uh, we've got some chaplains in the room. Uh, if you want prayer after this, we're going we're gonna to linger here. Uh, one of the things that, that we're trying to do and we're, we're, we're doing now uh, is at the end of the service, we're giving you an opportunity. If you have something you want to be prayed for and you just want somebody to agree with you in prayer, we're going to be here to pray with you. The second thing today in this invitation is this. Ask God to show you where you've been listening to the wrong voices about who He is and about what He has planned for you. Say, God, show me and help me to take myself out of that place. Help me to take myself out of that position. Because today, I want you to know this. God loves you. He is the author of good. And He doesn't bring evil in your life. What He does is He's given you Jesus Christ so that you have a retreat, a place to get away from the ridicule so that you can see the rescue that Jesus has provided for you and so that you can receive redemption. Let's all stand together this morning. Let's bow your heads in prayer with me. Father, I thank you today in this room, Lord, that your word has gone forth. And God, I pray that it was the word of your Holy Spirit speaking through me today and not my own words. But God, as we've heard the word today, I pray that you would just touch our hearts so that we have a clear understanding of who you are. Lord, if there's been any confusion or any chaos surrounding, I don't know why this happens, I don't know why that happens, let today be the day that your Holy Spirit just brings peace. And that we see and that we know, Lord, that you love us, that you care about us. God, and that you're with us in every situation, regardless, in Job's case, regardless of what he went through, regardless of what we go through, God, that we know you're still the God who loves us. And Lord, as we come today and as we offer ourselves to you, we say, God, we repent of our thoughts against you, of our thoughts toward you that are not lining up with what your word says or lining up with the character and the promise that you gave us through Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you'd forgive us today. If you, if you bow your heads with me today, if you're, if you're here and you say, you know what, I've never accepted Jesus in my life and I would like to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior, would you raise your hand right where you are? I want to pray with you this morning. If you're here today and you say, you know what, I've had some wrong thoughts about who God is, about what God has brought into my life. And I want prayer about it specifically. And I'll just pray with you right where you're standing. If you're there and you say, hey, that's me, would you just raise your hand right where you are? Thank you. Thank you. Again, we're going to be down here at the front at the end of the service. If you want prayer, if you want somebody to agree with you about any of these things, we want to pray with you. As I dismiss you in prayer today, I would ask that as we sing this song again, that you guys would just enjoy your fellowship with one another. And if you want prayer, to come on down because it's going to be a no pressure environment. And we're here to pray with you. My Father, I pray your blessing over every person in this room today. God, that you'd go with us, that you'd be with us, that you would make your face shine on every person. Lord, that loves you, that has accepted you, and that knows, God, that you're a good God and you care for us like a good Father. 
I thank you for today. I praise you for it. Be with us as we leave this place today. In the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you very much for being here today. Let's sing that chorus again.